It was a quiet day in the Galactic Council chambers, or at least as quiet as it ever got when 342 different species with wildly varying forms of communication, appendages, and bodily noises gathered in one place. Representatives of every spacefaring race from across the cosmos sat in their bubbles, pods, and hovering platforms, discussing the latest report on the nutritional crisis on Zoglar 5, which involved too many spores and not enough photosynthesis. Suddenly, the meeting was interrupted by the Secretary General of the Galactic Council, a towering Zagnar with skin that glowed like a neon jellyfish on a bender, stepping to the center of the chamber. Attention, representatives, the Secretary General intoned, his three eyes blinking in sequence like a malfunctioning traffic light. We have confirmed that Earth is no longer classified as a level 13 death world. The chamber fell silent. Well, as silent as a room full of 342 alien races with 342 types of breathing, gurgling, and humming could get. The news was monumental. Earth, infamous for its erratic weather, dangerous fauna, and worst of all, its unpredictable and caffeinated inhabitants, had been downgraded to a safer, more manageable level 12 death world, but most members still had concerns, even with the new downgrades. There were murmurs of disbelief chittering of confusion, and even a few glorp-like sounds of excitement. Earth had been avoided for centuries, ever since the last diplomatic mission resulted in a delegation accidentally mistaking coffee beans for organic fuel pellets and triggering a week-long hallucination festival on Glorbnax 4. But now, the Galactic Council was eager to re-establish contact. Let it be known, the Secretary General continued, that the Earthlings have agreed to a diplomatic mission. We shall send an envoy to sample their refreshments. The mere mention of Earth's beverages sparked curiosity. They'd all heard the legends of Earth's infamous coffee, tea, and the mysterious substance called chocolate. These concoctions were said to contain psychoactive chemicals that Earthlings consumed daily, often to the point of dependency. Some speculated that these substances might even explain humanity's erratic behavior on the galactic stage. Representatives were, understandably, nervous. We cross all of our appendages for luck, whispered a sleek, three-tailed envoy from the planet Corbel, trying to knot her tails together as she spoke. A series of flailing limbs, tentacles, and wing-like structures from other species followed suit, crossing whatever parts they could for good fortune. The mission, led by Ambassador Gronk of the planet Fliblat 9, arrived on Earth with a mix of trepidation and curiosity. Gronk was a typical Flibladian, nine feet tall, covered in a smooth bluish-green carapace, and equipped with four arms, each perfect for intricate diplomatic gestures, but utterly useless when it came to holding a cup. His assistant, Trixnox from Slubar 3, was a smaller, more spherical creature with a mass of eyes that could blink independently, giving the impression of an anxious disco ball. Upon landing, the Earthlings welcomed the delegation warmly, offering the full range of their world-famous beverages as a gesture of friendship. The humans proudly presented steaming cups of coffee, tea, and mugs filled with rich, melted chocolate. Ambassador Gronk examined the cup of coffee with a deep, skeptical gurgle, which in Flabladian roughly translated to, what fresh madness is this? Still, in the spirit of diplomacy, Gronk took a sip. At first, nothing happened. Then, everything happened at once. Gronk's multiple eyes widened, his exoskeleton vibrated with newfound energy, and he immediately felt like he could solve the energy crisis back on Fliblat 9 by himself. His four arms began twitching uncontrollably, and he started outlining complex mathematical equations in the air with his appendages. Coffee is power, he declared, as the rest of his delegation eagerly reached for their own cups. Not all the aliens reacted the same way, however. Trixnox from Slubber 3, who prided herself on her refined tastes, tried the tea. Her multitude of eyes squinted as she considered the subtle flavor profile. Hmm, this is acceptable, she mused, daintily sipping her Earl Grey. Quite relaxing, actually. The real chaos, however, started when the chocolate was introduced. A tall, insectoid creature from Yurkth 7 nibbled on a chocolate bar, and within seconds, it began emitting high-pitched squeals of delight. This... This is divine, it screeched, clutching the chocolate to its thorax like a long-lost lover. Soon, other delegates followed suit, and soon half the alien delegation was clutching coffee mugs, 
while the other half squabbled over the last of the chocolate supply. The only ones not indulging were the tea enthusiasts, who looked on with growing disgust. Barbarians, hissed a feathered ambassador from Pygol 12, cradling her chamomile tea protectively. Tea is the only civilized option here. By the time the aliens returned to their homeworlds, chaos had already begun to brew, which was an interesting way to say, shit had hit the fan. The Flabladian ambassador returned to his planet with a sizable shipment of coffee, and within weeks, the entire populace was hooked. The Flabladi, known for their calm and collected demeanor, were now constantly jittering, speaking faster than the speed of light, and holding coffee-fueled town hall debates that never ended. Gronk himself had taken to hosting 24-hour live-streamed philosophical discussions, fueled by double espresso shots. It's not just a beverage, he declared. It's the future. Meanwhile, on Slubber 3, where chocolate had become a sensation, the populace was experiencing what could only be described as a sugar-fueled revolution. Chocolate shops sprung up on every corner, and entire cities shut down for cacao holidays, where the Slabarian citizens engaged in week-long chocolate binges. Trixnox was appointed Grand Chocolate Taster, a position she accepted with all 137 of her eyes twinkling in chocolatey glee. On the other hand, the tea-loving species were appalled by the rising tide of what they saw as uncivilized beverages. Pygol 12, where tea drinking was considered an art form, launched a campaign to suppress the spread of both coffee and chocolate. Their leader, a dignified figure with an elaborate plumage, declared, tea is the foundation of a harmonious society. Coffee leads to chaos. Chocolate leads to madness. And so the great galactic brew ha, -ha began. Civil wars erupted across various planets. On Fliblat 9, pro-coffee and anti-coffee factions clashed in the streets, with espresso-sipping rebels hurling cappuccinos at their tea-drinking enemies. Meanwhile, on Slubber 3, the government split into two, the Chocoholics, who sought to install chocolate fountains in every public square, and the Purists, who insisted on moderation. Riots broke out, with mobs of chocolate enthusiasts wielding oversized chocolate bars like swords. As the chaos spread, the Galactic Council found itself in a bind. The sudden addiction to Earth's beverages had destabilized entire systems. Planets were on the brink of collapse, and interstellar trade had ground to a halt as more species joined the frenzy. Reluctantly, the Galactic Council turned to the one species that might be able to resolve the crisis, humans. A team of Earth's top negotiators, all proudly sporting coffee mugs, teacups, or chocolate bars, was dispatched to the heart of the conflict. They arrived on Fliblat 9, where Ambassador Gronk was in the midst of a 72-hour caffeine-fueled marathon speech about quantum coffee physics. Ambassador Gronk, shouted the human diplomat, interrupting the fervent debate. We need to talk. Gronk's eyes darted toward the humans. More coffee, he asked, hopeful. No, the diplomat replied, trying to remain composed. We need to stop the civil war you've accidentally started over caffeinated beverages. You aliens have become addicted. But coffee is life. We need IT, Gronk protested, forearms waving wildly. The human negotiator sighed. Look, we get it. Coffee is great, chocolate is amazing, tea is, well, tea, but you're tearing the galaxy apart over this. You need to learn moderation. Moderation. The word echoed through the chamber like a foreign concept, one that no one had ever considered before. The humans, in their wisdom, or at least their hard-won experience with caffeine addiction, helped broker a peace agreement. Each planet would be allowed to enjoy its preferred beverage, but trading coffee, tea, and chocolate across planetary lines would be regulated by the Galactic Beverage Treaty. Earth, of course, would supply the goods at a reasonable price, naturally. The galactic civil wars over beverages subsided, though the arguments over which was superior never truly ended. And thus, humanity's legacy in the galaxy wasn't its technology, its culture, or even its penchant for war. It was coffee and chocolate. Peace had returned to the galaxy, at least that's what the Galactic Council liked to believe. The humans had done their part by brokering the Galactic Beverage Treaty, which regulated the interplanetary trade of coffee, tea, and chocolate. Each species could now indulge in its preferred drink without causing too much chaos, in theory. However, the cracks in this fragile peace were already starting to show. On Fliblat 9, Ambassador Gronk's caffeine-fueled philosophical forums 
had become the hottest trend in the galaxy. They were broadcasted on every major interplanetary network, with millions tuning in to watch him dissect the mysteries of the universe while mainlining double espressos. Coffee is not just a beverage, Gronk proclaimed one night, his eyes bugging out of his head as his forearms jittered uncontrollably. It is the fuel for intellect. The galaxy needs more coffee. Over on Slubber 3, the chocolate-obsessed society was descending into something that looked suspiciously like a cacao cult. Trixnox, now revered as the high priestess of cacao, had built an entire temple dedicated to the worship of chocolate. Giant chocolate statues stood in the capital, where citizens came daily to pay homage and nibble on the edges. Rituals were performed where rivers of molten chocolate were poured in extravagant ceremonies, and every newborn Slabarian was given their first taste of cacao within minutes of birth. The tea-drinking factions, meanwhile, were quietly fuming. On Pygol 12, where the ritual of tea drinking had been a sacred practice for millennia, the rise of coffee and chocolate across the galaxy was seen as a barbaric affront to their traditions. The tea purists had taken to wearing elaborate ceremonial robes made from tea leaves to symbolize their commitment to order and tranquility. Secret meetings were held where they plotted how to reclaim the galaxy's dignity from what they called the caffeine-crazed heretics. And that's when things really began to unravel. The first signs of trouble came from the planet Durnok, a quiet agricultural world where both coffee and tea had gained a foothold. The Durnokians, a peace-loving amphibious species, had initially enjoyed the mix of both beverages. However, as more shipments of coffee arrived, a growing faction of Durnokians became addicted to the stuff. The Coffee Coalition, as they called themselves, began to demand that coffee be made the planet's official drink, pushing for public coffee fountains and mandatory coffee breaks. The tea drinkers, outraged by this, formed their own group, the Tea Defense League. They claimed that tea had been a cornerstone of Dernokian culture for centuries and that coffee was corrupting their society. Soon, peaceful protests turned into not-so-peaceful protests, and within weeks, the planet was embroiled in a full-blown civil war. The Galactic Council, alarmed by the brewing conflict, called an emergency session. We cannot allow this caffeine crisis to escalate any further, declared the Secretary General, his glow pulsing with frustration. Durnok is a critical agricultural supplier. If they collapse into civil war, we'll face shortages across the sector. But the Coffee Coalition is spreading across multiple planets, noted a reptilian diplomat from Grark II, anxiously sipping a cup of herbal tea. It's not just Durnok. There are reports of unrest on Glorbnax 4, and even whispers of dissent on the coffee-drinking planets themselves. The situation is unstable. It's not just coffee, added a frazzled ambassador from Pygol 12. The Chocoholics are exporting their madness, too. Entire planets are abandoning reason in favor of cacao binges. Chocolate festivals are turning into riots. We've even received reports of interplanetary smugglers moving illegal chocolate shipments to planets where it's banned. The chamber erupted into chaotic debate. Representatives shouted over one another, wings flapped, tentacles waved, and it was clear the galaxy was on the verge of another beverage-based catastrophe. Finally, the Secretary General pounded his glowing appendages on the podium. Enough, there is only one solution. The room fell silent, waiting for his decree. We must call upon the humans again. The humans, meanwhile, were not particularly surprised to receive the Galactic Council's distress call. They had seen this coming. After all, they were the galaxy's resident experts on caffeine addiction and its consequences. The lead human negotiator, Claire Jenkins, sighed as she read the latest report from Durnock. It's always the coffee, she muttered, sipping her own cup of joe. It starts with a little taste, then suddenly you're knee-deep in civil war. Her colleague, Marcus Patel, who had opted for tea, glanced over. Chocolate's no better. Did you see what's happening on Slubber 3? They're basically worshipping cacao now. Claire nodded grimly. And we're the ones who introduced all this chaos. Typical. The humans were quickly dispatched on another diplomatic mission, this time with a plan, an education campaign on the concept of moderation. Their first stop was Durnok, where they arrived to find the planet in disarray. The Coffee Coalition had taken control of the capital, 
while the Tea Defense League held the surrounding rural areas. The smell of freshly brewed coffee and steeping tea filled the air, and the tension was palpable. Claire stepped out of the human ship, holding a white flag of peace in one hand and a giant thermos of coffee in the other. Behind her, Marcus carried a massive tea kettle. The Durnokians eyed them suspiciously as they approached the center of the conflict. People of Durnok, Claire called out, using the universal translator. We come in peace and with beverages. There was a brief pause, and then the leader of the coffee coalition, a jittery Durnokian named Zebul, stepped forward. What is this? Are you here to help us? We demand more coffee. The leader of the Tea Defense League, a serene-looking Durnokian named Tiraz, floated up next to him. No, we need more tea. These coffee drinkers are out of control. Claire held up her hands. We understand your concerns, but trust me when I say you need to find balance. Coffee is wonderful, yes, but too much can lead to, well, this. She gestured to the chaos around them, Marcus chimed in. And tea is calming, sure, but it's not a solution for everything. You have to learn to coexist. Coffee, tea, and even chocolate, they all have their place, but moderation is the key. The Durnokians blinked their large amphibious eyes at the humans, confused. Moderation? The concept seemed utterly foreign to them. The idea that one could enjoy coffee and tea without falling into conflict was radical. To drive home the point, Claire and Marcus organized a caffeine summit. Durnokians from both sides were invited to sample moderate amounts of coffee, tea, and chocolate in a controlled environment. There were tasting stations, educational talks on the science of caffeine, and even workshops on mindfulness. At first, tensions remained high, but as the Durnokians sipped their carefully portioned beverages, they began to relax. The Coffee Coalition members realized that tea wasn't so bad in the afternoon, and the Tea Defense League begrudgingly admitted that a cup of coffee in the morning did have its perks, which actually moved things in your guts along to the available exit, and even if you don't have those things, it would do wonders for the mind. By the end of the summit, a fragile peace had been brokered. The Durnokians agreed to divide their beverage consumption by time of day, coffee in the mornings, tea in the afternoons, and chocolate for special occasions. The success on Durnok set a precedent, and soon the human negotiators were traveling across the galaxy, promoting their new campaign, everything in moderation. It wasn't easy. There were still some hard-line chocoholics who refused to give up their daily cacao binges and a few coffee extremists who formed underground espresso clubs, but gradually, the galactic unrest began to subside. Even Ambassador Gronk, once the galaxy's most vocal coffee addict, toned down his caffeine consumption. He now hosted his philosophical forums only twice a week instead of every night, and his speeches became significantly more coherent. The galaxy had been saved from the brink of civil war once again, thanks to the humans and their practical knowledge of caffeine. And though the debate over which beverage was truly superior would never end, at least now it was fought in coffee shops and tea houses, not on the battlefield. As for Earth, its reputation as a dangerous, unpredictable world had only grown. But this time, it wasn't because of its violent history or bizarre ecosystems. It was because of its beverages. This was a new category for the Galactic Council to consider in the ranking of worlds for their death world status.